I'm Michael Maloney. I'm a teacher. I'm also a school principal. I'm a school psychologist. And I'm a bit of a maverick. And today what I'd like to share with you is what we know about teaching children effectively. How many teachers do I have in the room? Please raise your hand. Okay, I've got a scattering of teachers. What I'd like to know from those people as we go through this is whether or not they have ever seen these methods, these technologies used in their professional lives. My guess is the answer to that question will definitely be no. What I'd like to show you today is a system that we put together some 30 years ago uh, that effectively works with both children and adults and I don't really care what the diagnosis is. There is a rule that I use in my learning center, which is about to celebrate its 30th year. The rule is, if the child can get from the door to the chair without feeling the wall, we can teach them to read, write, spell, or do arithmetic. And the corollary is, if we cannot, we will give you back the money. I've been around for 30 years. Obviously, I must be doing something right. Okay, so what is different about what I do and what many other teachers are trained to do? First and foremost, this is a model of all of the things that we need to do in order to effectively teach children. First, we need learning outcomes. What is the learning outcome? Well, if you look in many books, they simply are not there. They do not exist. If you look at some programs, they will have a description of what the program is about. They will have a scope and sequence chart. The scope will tell you the scope of the activities within the program. The sequence will tell you the order in which those activities are going to occur. <coughs> so that you can get some sense of a roadmap as to what you're doing and where you're going with this program. In many programs, it's up to the teacher to figure it out because it's not provided. If you looked at a typical reading program, it might say the child will understand or can understand the concept of phonemic awareness. Listen again. The child understands the concept of phonemic awareness. What does that mean to you? Right. It means about the same to me. Let's turn it around. Instead of using learning outcomes, this model uses something called behavioral objectives. So what is a behavioral objective? When I teach children to read, the behavioral objective is, one of the behavioral objectives is, the child can see and say sounds and sound combinations at 50 to 60 a minute with zero to two errors. Listen again. The child can see and say sounds and sound combinations at 50 to 60 per minute with zero to two errors. Can you see that? Could you measure that? Would you know whether or not the child can meet that objective? Yeah, it's relatively simple. You take the sheet of sounds, you say to the child, please say these for me, and you time them for 30 seconds. And they had better be able to do between 25 and 60 of them, or sorry, 25 and 30 of them in 30 seconds with no more than two errors, or they're not good enough yet for you to add another piece of curriculum to their program slightly different than what, my, than what many of us have experienced as students and as teachers. Behavioral objectives simply are a roadmap that teach you what you're going to teach, when you're going to teach it, and what the objectives are in terms of the standard the child must reach in order for you to be able to move on. Fundamental rule about all teaching. If the student didn't learn, the teacher didn't teach. Full stop. No exceptions. 
We do not blame the kid. We do not offload the responsibility for learning on the child. That is completely unfair, and it just isn't going to happen. So this is the first piece of the puzzle. You need a roadmap. You need a set of objectives for each area that tells you what the child is going to learn, the order in which they're going to learn it, and uh, what kind of standard they, that child is going to meet when you teach him well. The next thing, student management. If the children are not under instructional control, I don't care what you call it, it is not called teaching. You can walk by a classroom in any school and determine within one minute whether or not that teacher is competent at managing a classroom. How can you tell? Sorry? Yeah. You don't even have to open the door. What do you hear? Lots of noise. Okay? If you did open the door, what would you find? Children out of their seats. Children not attending to what they're supposed to be doing. Teacher trying to get them to do whatever it is he or she needs them to do and doing it badly. Let's go back to my teachers. If you were given a formal course in behavior analysis as part of your teacher training, please raise your hand. Right. You see why we have a problem? We send those teachers into the classroom without effective tools. Let me tell you a story. I was hired by the local school board to scrape kids off the wall because they were totally out of control. Okay? I'm the top gun. I made a deal with every principal I worked with. First of all, I would come to your school every afternoon, or every one afternoon every week to work with this teacher and to work with this, this job. Under the condition that for one hour of that time, you will cover the classroom so I can work with that teacher and teach them the skills so that they can become an independent manager themselves. I need to make an impression on these people first thing I did was to go to a school for highly challenged children. These children all have intellectual deficits. They cannot read, they cannot write, they are being fed, many of them are being toilet trained unsuccessfully, so aides are changing diapers all day. Mostly it's a warehousing situation and these kids are being warehoused. First thing I did was to take one of the aides, and within three weeks, the aides and I toilet trained every kid in the place. What do you think the principal thought? He thought I walked on water. So the word went out. This guy might know what he's doing. And then I got a call from a principal that said, I've got this really tough case for you. Can you handle it? I said, okay. Will you cover the classroom? Yes. And then we start. I walk in, I sit down in the classroom, there's 25 children in this group, grade 7 class, and there's one child there. He is getting kicked out of class three, four times a day. He's getting sent to the principal's office regularly. He's being thrown off the bus for being inappropriate on the bus. He's kicked out of the gymnasium and off the playground and out of the cafeteria, and he's just hell on wheels. He is just bad. And so the teacher said, can you help me with them? And I said, I think so. So I went home that evening and I created a small program. How many teachers did I see here? Please raise your hand again. Okay. Have you got time to wander around your class or your classroom with a clipboard counting behaviors on kids? Yes or no? No. Uh -huh. Once a week, yes. Once a week. No, no. We need to do this continuously, don't we, to, to, to be effective. Teachers don't have time to be running around trying to teach and at the same time uh, keep notes on kids. 
Well, so what we do, very simply, is I made a list. I took a, 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 a random timer. I watched this child. He could work for about 10 minutes, and then he'd be in trouble. And so I simply used a 10-minute schedule. And sometime within that 10 minutes, we set it up so that a timer would go off. He did not know when it was going to go off, because it was randomized. I then took that schedule of timings, and I taped it to the inside of a Tupperware bowl. And I got the timer and the Tupperware bowl, and I said to the teacher, who's your best student? So she said, Mary Ellen. So I went over to Mary Ellen, and I said, Mary Ellen, set it to the first number and put it underneath the Tupperware bowl, and go on with your work. And when the teacher tells you, when it goes off, the teacher says yes or no, then you mark it down. And this child is going to earn points for the class. And the teacher had a discussion with the class, and they decided that there were things that they would like. They would like to have a night without any homework. They would like to have extra gym time. They'd like to have a pizza party. They'd like to have all a number of things. And so what they did very simply was to make a list and then put a price on it. But the only person who can earn the points is the little rascal. And so she goes back to teaching. We set the timer. Seven minutes into the period, it goes ding. The teacher turns around and says, Darwin, nice job. You are paying attention. And Mary Ellen puts a point on the blackboard. How much teacher time does that take? Almost none. Yeah, I've been in the trenches. I know what it needs, but you need to be there. And so, what happens? Now, instead of getting Darwin into trouble, all of his classmates are trying to keep Darwin out of trouble. So they're encouraging him, they're warning him, they're helping him. He turns on a dime and becomes an angel. No more getting kicked off the bus, because that was two points, and he doesn't get kicked off the bus. No more getting kicked out of the cafeteria, another two points. No more getting run off the playground. He can earn the points by doing it the right way. He wanted to be the star, to earn the pizza party. He was king. And he turned on a dime and all of his bad behavior disappeared. What does the teacher think? I walk on water, right? Yeah. What does the teacher, what does the principal think? Well, he's happy. What about mom? Yeah, she's not getting those nasty phone calls. Come and get your kid. About three weeks into this, I was in the classroom. They were doing a worksheet of word problems in arithmetic. Math word problems. And I walked down beside his desk, and I looked down, and this had been going on for 10 minutes. And I looked at him, and he had his scribbler open, and his textbook open, and his pencil in his hand, and there wasn't a mark on the page. And I said to him, Darwin, is this hard? He said, yeah. Well, let me help you. What's so hard? He said, some of the words. I said, okay. Tell me which ones. I'll help you with them. He looked at me. At me. This is a kid in grade 7, 12 years old. Looked at me with his big brown eyes. And he said, it's all of them. What did I do to this child? I turned him into a dead man. He looks like a student, but what is he learning? Nothing. Okay, hot shot. Now what are you going to do? Am I looking after that child? No. Principal's happy, teacher's happy, mom's happy. What about the kid? He's getting nowhere. So I took myself for a long walk, and I said, okay, smarty, what are you going to do now? Well, I do what any good 
person trained the way I was as a research psychologist would do. I went to the nearest university, went to the stacks of the graduate school, started looking in the index in all the journals for how do you teach children to read. And I found a study that I'll tell you about in a moment. So what we need here is good behavior management. And good behavior management comes from behavior modification. And what I was using, if we get technical for a second, was what is called a BR10 schedule reinforcement. Or a B, sorry, a VI10, a variable interval 10. He has no idea when it's going to go off. At some point it's going to go off. I think we can kill that air conditioner. People are getting cool. VR is a variable ratio or variable response. Okay, uh, Eva? We're getting people, I think, are getting. Thank you. Just kill it all together. Thank you. If you get too warm, please raise your hand. We'll turn them back on. Okay? I don't like people to be cool. All right. So what we've done is to take our technology from behavior modification and apply it to the classroom. There are only about 100,000 different studies available for us to use based on the research in the last 30 to 40 years. And we can use this very well to uh, get the children under instructional control. Let me tell you one thing. I was incredibly impressed by how well this staff is doing it in this school. I watched carefully to see children not Complying with instructions. It happens very rarely. So our teachers here, in terms of this piece, are well on their way to managing that. The next piece of the puzzle is instruction. Now that you've got them in your seats, you've got to be able to teach them well. And the question becomes, how do you know when a child is being well taught? Well, if you look at the research, then you will find some examples of instructional programs that are highly effective. You will find other examples of programs that are not. And what we need to be able to do is to discriminate between the ones that work and the ones that don't. And I'm going to be perfectly frank with you, most parents haven't got a clue about what works and what doesn't. We spend more time picking out a new car than we do picking out a new curriculum. Mostly, we don't know what to look for. We have no idea whether this is going to work or not. We rely on the experts. It's a bad choice. The experts don't know either. Okay. You need to be diligent. You need to ask the right questions. Direct instruction. This is an instructional model. For all my well-trained other professionals in the room, how many of you have heard of the follow-through study? This always happens. Notice no hands are up. The follow-through study is a study in which 16 different methodologies were compared with over a half a million children for more than 20 years at a cost of 2.2 billion US dollars. And those are 1968 dollars, when money was real. When I found that Darwin couldn't read, I went to the stacks looking for information. I ran into a study called the follow-through study. It was a study of these 16 different methods. When I read it, I then got on an airplane and flew to the University of Oregon and to a gentleman named Zig Engelman. Let me tell you about the study. In the late 60s, Martin Luther King was assassinated, Medgar Evers was killed, Malcolm X was assassinated, Bobby and Jack Kennedy were killed. All kinds of people who were in favor of pushing the uh, movement for civil rights forward were being wiped out at some point. The black community just basically said, enough. And then Watts was in flames, and the tanks were in the streets in Detroit, and Newark was ablaze, and you could look around the country, and there was a whole host of civil unrest. Lyndon Baines Johnson pulled his cabinet together, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, we don't do something, we are going to have a race war. And he, if you go back to your history, or if you're old enough to remember this, he declared what was called the War on Poverty. 
an opportunity for poor, especially uh, African American and other minority groups within the United States to become part of the American dream. Within that mandate, he gave an initiative to the Federal Department of Education. And he said to them, the real successful way to, to finish this problem off is to make sure that children coming up in the next generation are successful at school, can get an education, can move up. So we are going to start a project. It's going to be called Head Start. How many people here have heard of Head Start? Okay, some of you have. Head Start was a preschool program where children from poor families were started at the age of three or four, and for three years before they went to school, they were going to nursery schools to be taught things that would help them to be successful when they got to school. And that would give them a chance to become effective students. So Head Start was launched. Within a year, they decided that Head Start was not going to be sufficient. And so they gave a mandate to the public schools to do a project called Follow Through. The, what they were going to do was follow these children through the first three years of school. And at the end of that time, these children should be in a position to be able to exist in a classroom effectively. Okay. So, they wrote to every university, to every foundation, to anybody who had anything to do with education and said, if you have a method that will teach children who are likely to fail at school to be successful, please let us know. We are going to start a huge research project we would like you to be part of. Sixteen different groups put up their hand and said, we do that. So then, they basically said to the schools, we would like you to join this research initiative. We would like you to become part of the program. Now think about it. If you're the principal of the middle school in Tupelo, Mississippi, and you get one more fat manila envelope from your federal government asking you if you would like to fill this out so that you can become part of a study, what do you think is going to happen? Well, Mr. Principal, don't you have enough to do? And if, by the way, if at that back in 68, it was Mr. Principal. There were very few women ever put in that position. So what did the principal do? Typically, they'd have taken that and put it in the round file. Well, the director of education knew this would happen, and so they basically set it up and said, if your school needs money, read this. And it said, Mr. Principal, we're starting a research project. We would like your school to be involved. If your school becomes part of this project, we will pay the salary of a teacher for every 25 children involved in the project. We will pay the salary of an aide for every eight children involved in the project. We will provide you a consultant for one week out of every month for the entire three years to make sure that the project, whichever model you're in, is properly set up and properly administrated, and your staff is properly trained and monitored. We will give you all the materials that you need to run whatever project model you happen to fall into. And we will do the same thing for the control group who's going to be across the hall. Now, how long do you think it's going to take the principal from Tupelo, Mississippi, to fill out that document? Yeah, it'll be there tomorrow. But if that wasn't rich enough, they also said to the principal, we will also give you a $500 per year grant for every child involved in the project for each three years. That's at a time when teachers were making $4,000 a year. Obviously, they got a, a, a wide response to the request. And they picked 125,000 children in schools across America. And they ran the project for three years. And they had outside evaluators come in and do the pre-testing and yearly, yearly measurements. And then at the end, they, they wrote a final report and submitted it to the director of education. 16 different models, 125,000 children, three years of study, $750 million worth of research. What do you think the results look like? 
how many of the 16 models were effective? Two. The one that was most effective was called direct instruction. From the University of Oregon by a guy named Zig Engelman. It accounted for 75% of the variance in the data all by itself as one of 16 models. The other 25% was accounted for by the behavior modification model that came out of the University of Kansas. Two methods worked, 14 were either no effect or in some cases less effective than the control groups. The director of the Office of Education gets this, this uh, final report. What's he do? Well, let, let me give you one hint. The Teachers Union of America hates this one, and they can't stand this one. So what do you think is going to happen? We're going to go back and tell the Teachers of America you're going to teach direct instruction and behavior modification methods in your classroom? I don't think so. So the Director of Education went back to the President and he said, 75% of the results are this one, 25% are accountable by that one. We think that this is a fluke. We think this is a statistical anomaly that you sometimes get in research. And so they jumped the study. And they decided they better do it again. So they got a new set of outside evaluators. You have to shoot the messenger. They got another 125,000 children, another three years, another $750 million, and three years later, what do you think happened? Take a risk, somebody. What happened? The same thing. Yes. The second report shows 75% of the data accommodated by direct instruction, approximately 25% by behavior analysis, and now we can hardly blame that on a statistical anomaly, can we? Now we no longer have a research problem, now we have a political problem. So what did they do? Replicate the experiment. Five more times. It ran for 20 years. It cost $2.2 billion. The results were never widely disseminated. It became a large secret. I found the follow-through study with this kind of power. I got on a plane. I flew to University of Oregon. I walked into Zig Engelman's office. I said, hi, I'm Michael Maroney. I'm from Canada. I have kids that need to learn how to read. I know you know how to do that. I want you to teach me, and I'm not going away until you do. And Zig took me under his wing, and he made me a really fine direct instructor, instruction teacher and trainer. And I came back to Hastings County, the school board that I was working in, and I set up programs. The very first program I set up was for Darwin and his illiterate friends in the grade 8 class, because of course they had moved them on. And I taught Darwin three years of reading in the next 10 months. Not enough. He wasn't caught up, but he was sure a lot further than he'd been. And the program spread, and it went from one school to another to another. And pretty soon, we had them in all 62 schools. And that's when the trouble began. Because the children who were in special education started to learn two to two and a half years of reading and writing and spelling and math every year. And the parents started coming into the school asking to have their kids transferred out of grade five regular class into our special ed class. And when the principal asked them why, they said, well, because my special ed child can read, write, spell, and do math better than my regular grade five kids. And so, rather than change the system, they shot the messenger. And the next year, I didn't have a job. 
Now, interestingly enough, the union came to me and offered to fight for me. And I said, well, will you fight for Linda and Eric and the other people who don't happen, who are consultants, but don't happen to be teachers? They said, no, we can't do that. I said, fine, then don't bother fighting for me either. And we all left. And I started my first learning center. So what is direct instruction? Okay. Let's give you a quick lesson. All right? Everybody on this side of the group, you are my very, very gifted, bright <coughs> students. Okay? Got it? You're my you know, top level, many, many, many neurons firing all the time kids. Uh, you people here on this side, I'm sorry to tell you this. <laughs> You're a little slow. Okay? You don't really get it. This group has a collective IQ of about 4,000 each. Uh, we have a collective IQ of about 40 in total. Okay? Now, I'm going to give this group the standard Socratic presentation. Now, in the Socratic presentation, what we'll do is we'll ask questions, and we'll see if we can narrow down what the concept is until we finally get it. Okay? The concept I'm going to teach you is called blurb. All right? Now, I'm sorry, my special ed kids, just try to hang in there with me for a little while, okay? Yeah, just chill. Okay. All right, you right, guys. Here we go. This is Glarm. Got it? Yeah. What could Glarm possibly be? Let's let's see if we can get some some ideas going here so we can narrow this down. What could Glarm possibly be? Oh, don't be so shy. You're, you're all right. Come on. Okay, I'll let give you a hint. Could it be one? Could Glarm be the concept one? Yes. Wait. How many are there? One. Yeah. How many are there? One. Yeah. Well, that's a great idea, but that's not the essence of learn. Okay. Well, could learn be two? Sure. Yeah. Because there's got two parts, right? Could it be three? Well, there's a tip right there. It's got ink on it. Yeah. It could be three. Too. It's none of those. Could learn be something held in the right hand? Uh, that's a great idea. It's not exactly what I'm looking for. Could Blurm be smaller than an elephant's trunk? Could we do this for a very long time and never find out what Blurm is? And even if we did, could someone go home with the notion that Blurm is one and someone else go home with the notion that Blurm is something held in the left hand? All right. Not a great way to teach. They have, have, they, have my really bright group got this yet? No. Even my special ed kids can recognize you. You're not getting it. <laughs> okay. Come on, you potatoes, all right? Or, or are they turnips, okay? We're gonna teach you learn using direct instruction, all right? I want you to work really hard and make me look good, all right? Okay, here we go. This is learn. Okay. That's not learn. This is learn. That's not learn. That's not learn. This is learn. That's not learn. This is learn. Somebody tell me what learn is. Come on. Straight up. What do you call something straight up and down? Vertical. Yeah. Okay. Smart guys. How come all my little guys got this and you didn't? What? What was so easy? It was the way I taught it. I showed you examples. I showed you non-examples. I showed you the smallest difference between an example and a non-example. If you can do this, how easy is it to do this? Right? Okay. So direct instruction will show you examples of a concept or an operation. It will show you non-examples of a concept or operation. And it will show you the smallest difference between what is an example and is what is not an example. Okay. How do we apply that to curriculum? Well, let's take that. The first thing we're going to teach our children in this classroom when we start teaching their arithmetic after we do their counting and they're starting to do their operations like addition, we're going to teach them the difference between what is a plus sign and what is not a plus sign. Okay, I'll tell them. This says plus. This does not say plus. This says plus. This does not say plus. And I will systematically tell them exam and show them examples and non-examples of the plus sign. And when they can do it quickly and easily, then we can begin to do the operation. 
Alright, here we go. Is this a plus? Ready? Yes. yes. Just say yes or no to each one. Ready? Yes. Ready? Uh, Wait till I touch it. Where am I? Are any of my classroom teachers here? Oh, there they yeah, if my classroom teachers were here now, I've trained them. You make the students wait until they all say it at once. If you're working with groups, you know why. But you see, I got Smart Sally up here. Smart Sally wants to impress me, so she'll always jump my signal. And I got Shy Sue. Shy Sue doesn't like to make a mistake, so she'll hang back and wait for Smart Sally to tell her, then she'll just chime in at the end. And I never know whether or not she knows anything. So we have to do it like the choir. When I touch it, we'll all say it. Here we go. Just say yes or no. Ready? Yes. Ready? No. Ready? No. Ready? No. Ready? Yes. You're good. All right. One more time. Ready? Yes. Ready? Yes. Ready? No. Could we teach a child the concept of what the plus sign is all about by doing this? Sure we can. How do we, how do we use this with reading? Read these words for me. Everybody ready? In. Ready. In. Ready. Draw. Ready. Draw. Ready. Can. Ready. Off. Ready. Done. Okay, here's your rule. E at the end of the word makes the vowel say its name. Listen again. E at the end of the word makes the vowel say its name. Say the rule. Ready. E at the end of the word makes the vowel say its name. I gotta hear everybody. One more time. Ready. E at the end of the word makes the vowel say its name. All right. Watch this. Is there any at the end of the word? Ready. Is there any? Oh, you see? Come on, you gotta listen. I didn't ask you to read the word, did I? No, I asked you if there was an E at the end of the word. My students have to listen. Otherwise, they're not under my control. And I'm not teaching them. Alright. Is there any at the end of the word? Ready? Yes. yes. Good job. Alright. Is there any at the end of the word? Ready? Yes. Will the vowel say its name? Ready? Yes. Will the vowel say its name? Ready? Yes. What's the rule? E. That was pitiful. E at the end of the word makes the vowel say its name. Come on, ready. E at the end of the word makes the vowel say its name. Now say it quickly, ready? E at the end of the word makes the vowel say its name. All right, is there an E at the end of the word, ready? Yes. Will the vowel say its name, ready? Yes. What's the vowel's name? Ready? I. So what's the word? Ready? I. Okay, think big now. <laughs> Read these words. First word, ready? I. Ready. Row. Ready. Row. Ready. Row. Ready. Row. Ready. Row. Ready. Row. Ready. Do. Uh, I like that a lot better. Okay. Now, I've shown you non-example. Now I've shown you examples. Now I'm going to take out some of them and force you to determine whether they are examples or non-examples. Right? Blur, not blur. E, not E. Read these words first. We're ready. In. All together, ready. In. Ready. Time. Ready. Row. Ready. Raw. Ready. Can. Ready. Oh. Ready. Do. Can we apply it to higher? Orders thinking skills. Okay, some birds fly, but well, let's do this one. All birds eat. A, sea bee, a seagull is a bird. So what else do we know? Help them out. Go ahead. I help them out. So yeah, what's the conclusion? So uh, the seagull eats. The seagull eats. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. Let's do this one. No birds cry. An eagle is a bird. So what do we know? Eagles don't run. Okay. Some birds do not fly. An ostrich is a bird. What do we know? An ostrich may not fly. This says some. Here's the rule. If the word in the in the first part, which is called the rule, all deductions are made up of three parts. There's the rule, the middle part, and the conclusion. Here's the deal. If the if it's universal, we're going to say all or none or no. If it's particular, we're going to say maybe or maybe not. So, no birds, universal. Some birds, 
particular? Well, we got to figure, there we go, negative. So we've got particular, negative. Maybe does not. All right. Make sense? How do we know to make the conclusion? It's real simple. Take a look at the conclusion, or at the, at the uh, deduction. Cross out the word that's common, the noun that's common to the rule and the middle part. Make up the rest of the conclusion from the nouns that are left. So what do you got left? Eagle, drive, and no. Simple? Right. Some birds fly the cause of fish, so? Grass is green. Huh? Grass is green. Yeah. Nothing. It's a non-example, isn't it? So we teach them examples and non-examples so that they can tell what, how the system works. They can, my kids can just do this. Well, it's some, so it's got to be this one. And it's uh, positive, so it's got to be this one. So it's going to say maybe. Okay, so down here, maybe. Cross this out. Uh, bird, bird. I got kiwi and fly, so maybe a kiwi flies. Yes? Yes. Do I care? I look for the behavior. I want a child who can write the conclusions to deductions at 10 conclusions per minute. If they can't write 10 conclusions to deductions per minute, I'm sorry, they don't know them. How can he get it right if he can't understand it? I mean, he's not just going to get lucky 10 times out of 10, is he? Yeah, all he's doing is learning a system that works every time. Right? What's wrong with that? Okay. <laughs> no, see, that's important because you can't get inside the kid's head to know what he is or is not thinking. The only thing you can do is look at the production that he has and determine A, is it correct, and B, is it fast enough? And when he's really good, they can do 10 to 15 a minute. All right. So we have a methodology for teaching. <coughs> the next thing we need to do as teachers is to measure what we taught. If you don't know where the child is today, how in earth are you ever going to know whether you should add curriculum tomorrow? Repeat what you did today. You're lost. You're flying blind. So we need to find a measurement system that will allow us to find out how well our teaching worked. And that's called precision teaching. Precision teaching is a measurement system. And it counts on frequency. The frequency of behaviors. How fast do you breathe? That's, yeah, you haven't counted for a long time. How long do you been breathing? A long time, right? Yeah, that's interesting. How fast do you walk? The answer is, I don't know. Isn't it? How fast do you talk? never thought of it in those terms. What we're looking at is using frequency as an indicator of performance. How fast should you be able to read aloud? You should be able to read aloud approximately 200 words per minute. Why 200 words a minute? Because that's how fast you can and if you can read aloud at the same rate at which you carry on a conversation, I can pretty much guarantee you there's nothing on the page that's causing you a problem. If you cannot read at about the same rate that you carry on a conversation, there's probably something on that page that's holding you up. And you are not fluent. Correct? Of course it does. Yes. We have to stage the material to, to the skills of the child, increasing it until they're absolutely competent readers. And this is my, thank you for asking the question. This is my commercial moment. 
That's why we wrote 34 reading books instead of just four. Because we're in series of five sets from kindergarten through grade eight. Okay. Yeah. It's absolutely right. We gotta place the child properly, we gotta take it from there. Yes. Okay. The way that we do that is to take a sample of the child's performance every day. Any nurses in the room? No nurses? Okay. Nurses take vital signs, right? You're in the hospital, they come around a couple, three times a day, they check your pulse, they check your respiration, they check your blood pressure, they check your temperature, they, get a, they write it all down. They pass it off to the next nurse when they change shifts. Now if you happen to be in a cardiac unit or an ICU, is there more measurement or less measurement? More, a lot more, yeah. In schools, is there more measurement of special ed kids or less measurement of special ed kids? less. Yeah, they, in fact, they exempt them from most of it. They'll drag their scores down. So what we need is a system by which we can gather information about a child's performance right now and determine whether or not our teaching worked. So, let's go back to this. Read me these words. First word, ready. Oh, come on now. Here we go. Ready. 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 Good. We're doing this about one a second, right? So I can pace you through that in 60 a minute. When you're first learning that, you can't do that. As I teach you well, you can do that quickly and accurately. When I can teach you 60 words a minute, see, say, rule, final E rule words, then I know you've got it nailed. And if I just turn that over to you, would you be my guinea pig? Read me this this morning. Go ahead. Do this how you get one. Yeah, go ahead. Just can I get a measure of that? Yeah. I can time her for 30 seconds. Ask her to read a list of words that have Examples and non-examples of the rule, couldn't I? I can put that on a chart, and this is the rate which she's doing it today. And I know that she should be able to do 80 of these a minute. Because thousands and thousands of kids in the Sacagawea study proved that to us. So now I know that children should read word lists at 80 words a minute when they're good at it. If they're in kindergarten grade one, I can live with 60 because they're just cutting their teeth, right? But when they get to grade three, they better be able to do eight. And if they can't do 80, what is it telling me? We either didn't do enough teaching or we didn't do enough practice. They are not at a standard where you can now add more things to their curriculum. You keep adding things to their curriculum, I'll guarantee you bury them. And they will struggle and they will cry at the kitchen table doing their homework and they will be frustrated and angry and they'll make your life hell. Okay. So we use a sample of performance, and it's done on the basis of frequency. And here's the fun part. When I take a frequency today, and I take another frequency tomorrow, and I take one the day after that, what I get is frequency over time, which is called rate. So now I can see, are the line, is the performance going up? Is the performance line flat? Is the performance actually going down? What, what is happening with this child? And I want to see the performance going up, and I want to see the errors going down. And I put a dot on one on part of the day and an X on the chart for the mistakes, and I can track them over time. When I have five dots, I can begin to extrapolate. Well, if he's doing this fast, if he's learning at this rate, we should hit that standard in about two, three weeks. Because now I can see the rate at which he's learning. And that gives me pretty good predictability about how long I'm going to have to spend on this, on this amount of curriculum, on this piece of curriculum before he has a nail. I can tell how long it's going to take him before he can read a list like that at 60 to 80 words a minute. So whether he can tell me this at 60 examples and non-examples of the plus sign per minute or whether he can read 125 words in his story that we've been teaching him. 
the next thing we need is directed practice. We don't just teach a, kid a skill and turn it over to the child. If you do, the likelihood is they will take it home, practice it the wrong way, wind up practicing errors, then they bring it all back to you, it's all confused, and now you get to unravel all of that, reteach it, and try to get it right. You don't want to be doing that. That's much too time consuming, it's much too hard on everybody. So before we turn it over to the kids completely, we have a pair of watchful eyes watching the child do it so that we know they're getting it right. And until then, I will not send it home as homework. Because I cannot trust that the child knows it well enough to be able to do it independently. When they get halfway to the standard, whatever that standard is, then I can turn it over to the child. This is new, isn't it? Yeah. This is it's revolutionary. It's only been around for almost a half a century. And it's almost still revolutionary because public schools won't use it. It holds way too much accountability. Private schools won't use it because parents can too easily tell whether the big bucks they're paying is getting them anything. So that leaves this small group of bandits out there that goes around teaching kids <laughs> who need lots of help how to become better students. And I don't care whether they've got Asperger's or whether they've got autism or whether they've been diagnosed with ADHD, the rule still works. If the child can get from the chair to the wall or sort of from the door to the chair without feeling the wall, we can teach them to read. And if we can't, we ought to give them back the money. I've been doing this for 30 years. We've taught 50,000 children who have fallen through the cracks how to do what other kids can do. I teach adults. I take injured workers who are illiterate. They quit school in grade nine because they couldn't read. They became roofers. And then they fell off the roof. And now they've got three fused vertebrae in their back. And they can't get another job because they can't fill out the application form and they can't read the want ads. I take them for one year and then I send them to college, into technical programs at colleges. And 92% of my students survive first semester and only 63% of the public school district's students survive first semester. And I do it in one year and they get 12. And it's not me. It's all about using the research to find the pieces that actually deliver and putting them together and being able to make those available to teachers. Now, my teachers in here, how many are direct instruction trained? Verifies my claim that the public schools don't use it. How many people here have ever used a standard acceleration chart for precision teaching? No. We do not provide these tools for our teachers. Therefore, you may not blame the teacher when the child does not do well. If you do not train the doctor in the appropriate methodology for removing appendix, don't be afraid too surprised when the person develops eczema or whatever the, I can't remember what the actual disease is, when they get an internal uh, inflammation that you know becomes systemic and they are at serious risk. We train our doctors in very standard, specific ways to do apodectomies. It doesn't much matter where you go, which hospital you go to, they're done pretty much the same way. We don't do that with our teachers. And therefore, we run the risk of not having teachers who know how to handle even the good kids. Education as a discipline does not look at research. They do not use research. We do not implement it. We are where medicine was about 100 years ago, when they still used leeches and bloodletting and you know, all kinds of weird and wonderful remedies, wrapping people in towels, 
cold towels. We move beyond that in medicine. We have not moved beyond that in education. I'm kind of on the pointy end. I've been out here for a long time. I'm not getting any younger. And I'm going around as much as I can, passing this off to people like the Scott at the school so that they can implement it and it will take root here and it will take root in various places and we will be able to gradually impact the way in which education That's probably a little different than any educational lecture you can do. Maybe it raises a few questions. Feel free to ask them. Yes. Dibbles. Yeah. And the question is, how, how different is it from Dibbles? Dibbles is a bookmarking type of evaluation process used in you know, three times a year in schools to determine where kids are. Okay. Uh, how many people here use a camera? Lots of you, right? You ever taken a snapshot? You look at it, and you got a, you got a really weird picture. Why? Because you caught the person one precise moment in time. Right. That's what Dibbles does. Only it does it four times a year. What you really want is VCR, or, or you, know, you want a camcorder. You want to see the whole behavior. Well, that's what precision teaching allows you because you get data every day. Yeah. So it's quite different. Dibbles is better than nothing, absolutely. But it's not as good as continuous measurement. My question of this is always the same. Yeah, yeah. Q and A. That's what we're doing, right? <laughs> uh, basically, I have the same question of anybody who asks me, "What about this system? What about this method? What about?" My first response to that is, "Where's the data? Show me the data from Macquarie University in Australia that demonstrates that this consistently works with kids." If I cannot see that data printed in peer-evaluated journals, replicated with reasonable numbers of kids, I don't care. I don't have time. This has half a million kids involved in it. This has an eight-year study with hundreds of thousands of children. This has 100,000 studies in the journals. These are very seriously researched and reported upon technologies and methods that we can demonstrate work. I don't have time for something that I have to go find out. Is you know, I can't afford to have my kids as guinea pigs. You know, as, as parents of autistic children, you're watching the clock. If your kid is on the autism spectrum, you want to get as much done as fast as you possibly can because you know the longer they go without making progress, the harder it gets to make progress. That's just true. That We, we know that to be true. So. We don't have time to say, well, what about this program? Let's try this. I'm sorry, you could burn up six months and not really know whether that's having any effect. There are things that we do know about autism. We know that there are some things in diet that work with some children. We know there are medications that work with some children. There's no one-size-fits-all, that's for sure. We know that, too. But I think we can also now begin to see that this model in terms of teaching them skills, academic skills, would be a very useful model. The prerequisite for this is they need to have language skills. If they don't have language skills, how do we teach them to read? How do we teach them to do higher order thinking skills? How do we teach them to spell? I'm sorry, you can't. So you have to get the language skills to a given level before we're going to be able to bring this in and impact those other areas of the curriculum that they so desperately need. Now here's the good news. Zig Engelman, the best instructional designer to ever put on a pair of shoes, only wrote three different language programs. And I was working with supervisors who are the therapists in the field, uh, and they have a language, an existing language program, and I suggested to them we compare some of the methods that they use with what's in direct instruction. And a lot of it matches up rather nicely. 
and the measurement that they're doing can be added to. They can add little things from precision teaching that will help them make more frequent and better decisions about those kids. Now, I haven't had an opportunity to train them yet. And I hope someday soon I'll get an opportunity to come back and work with the therapists in the field in the same way that you're working with the teachers here in the classroom. Because those are tools they also can use. But it requires training, it requires practice, you need to be monitored. It's not, you know, it's not something we can just stick in the mail. Other questions? Yes. Uh, the question is how how long and how easy is it to get training? Um, right now, I have got three huge major projects underway. I came out here because Dino and Eva kind of leaned on me and said, "We really got to get you over here now because we're opening the school." And so the answer is. It doesn't take long, but you're half a world away from me. And I've got these two ongoing projects that I have to wrap up before I can really commit to doing anything else uh, too seriously. I might be able to squeeze a week out somewhere in the middle of the winter or early spring to be able to help train therapists here. But I cannot say, I'll just come to Hong Kong and stay here for a month and we'll get it all done. I can train. I can train a teacher in six hours to become a good reading teacher. Yeah. Six hours. Typically, it's not that hard. Everyone thinks teaching reading is so difficult. They think it's something mystical. Well, it's not. It's really easy. You teach them about five major tasks, and when they learn those five tasks, they, they pretty much got it down. So, and in fact, we did it this week, right? We we got the staff here able to, to do the, the reading program. And I'll be willing to bet that they'll, they'll get it done very well over the next couple, three weeks. We have at least four children went through four lessons this week in the program. And we just started. Yes? Yes, whenever I get the opportunity, but no school board wants this. Yeah, but I'm a private company. I'm a hired guy. They never asked me. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, they put the red dollar sign on it. Yes, I did. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm not cheap. So what was I'm the good. question? Yes. Yeah, I have approximately three to 4,000 homeschooling moms and dads that sit at the kitchen table with their children uh, across the United States and teach their children reading, writing, spelling, and math. So yeah, I'm, I'm in the homeschool market in the United States and Canada, uh, and again, these are skills. You know, there's nothing magical about having a teacher study. There's fact. Yes. Yeah. Can we get to the question? What's the question? If they're going to live in a Spanish speaking speaking culture, they need to speak Spanish. Okay. My my program is not going to work in Spanish. Why is that? It, it will not work in any other language other than English. Okay, here's why. This is a rule for the final E rule in English. What's the equivalent rule in Chinese? <laughs> we don't know. Some of that stuff will work if you teach it in English. It's not a simple question of translation. Because what we have to do is look at the language, see how it's set up, pull those rules out, make them explicit to the child, design the examples, design the non-examples, design the near-in examples, 
It's not simply, let's translate this into Chinese and put it out in the Chinese community. It will fail. Yeah. And it's true for, for Spanish as well, unfortunately. Now, the good news for you is that there are Spanish programs that are direct instruction. And if you, if you write to McGraw-Hill, you can get some, but not many, you can get some programs that are in Spanish. McGraw-Hill is the publisher of all of this material, other than myself. Tell them, after 70 hours of teaching, how many words the children should know? Because this like, is strong. <laughs> like this one, don't you? <laughs> I have one spelling program uh, that we teach to children typically about grade three, and to all of my adults. Okay. It has 140 lessons. And uh, each lesson takes about 15 minutes. By the time I finish the 140th lesson, the learner has learned to spell 12,600 words. Now think about that for a minute. If you start in a regular classroom, in a regular school, with a regular kid, every Monday your teacher gives you 25 words to learn, you take home the list, you memorize it, you come in on Friday, you do the text. And then you forget about it because there's a whole new word list. And that goes on for 40 weeks because most school years are about 40 weeks long. Well, that's 25 times 40, that's 1,000 words. You start spelling in grade 2, you finish spelling into grade 7, so you get 6 years, 7 years of spelling. 6,000, 7,000 words in 7 years. We can teach 12,600 words in 140 lessons or in less than about 70 years. You want to see how it works? Yes. Okay. <coughs> when do you know to use ES instead of S to make a word plural? What's the rule? We're not sure, right? Okay. Here's a rule. If the word ends with CH, SH, S, X, or Z, use ES. If it doesn't end, CH, SH, SX, or Z, use S. So the kid writes this down. SH, CH, SX, Z. Good. Then you give them a list of words. You think they can figure it out? Yeah. All right. Here we go. Everybody, S or ES. Ready? Yes. Why? SH. SH. S or ES. Ready? S. Why? No. Not CH. S or ES, ready? Yes. Next, ready? Yes. Yeah. So what will I do? I'll provide the child the rule. I'll make the rule explicit. I'll give them examples of the rule. I'll give them non-examples of the rule. And when they're done, I'll give them a worksheet that has a whole 80 words on it with and without ES applications. And I'll say, ready, please begin. And they write as fast as they can. And Humans write 20 to 30 words a minute, so when the child can write correctly 20 to 30 words using S or ES rules, I can then say, this kid knows the rules. Let's move on. What's the Y to I rule? Say, what? Why to I rule? I've never heard of it. Yeah. There are 16 rules. Most of us know two or three. Think of a rule you've learned about spelling. Can you tell me that? I before E except after C. I before E except after C. Exactly, that's one. That's one almost everybody gets to be taught, right? Any others? Change the Y to I and add ES. Isn't that one you Right? You want to make a word that ends in Y plural? You change the Y to I and add ES? That's another one. That's about it. You're about done. I could say 100 Hong Kong dollars for somebody else who can tell me a spelling rule. I'm pretty safe. <coughs> Don't bet me that hundred bucks because you're toast. I'll tell you about the O-R-E-R -E rule, the doubling rule, the short vowel rule. Where do you want to go from here? Here's one for you. Everybody tell me the vowels. Ready? A-E-I-W. And sometimes Y. Hello? What kind of instructional design is that? A-E-I-O and you and sometimes Y. Well, good luck. Yeah, just 
whatever you think that Y should be a vowel, you know, we'll just, right. Okay, so when is Y a vowel? When it's at the end of a word. Why don't they just show us that? Why is a vowel when it's at the end of a word? It's so simple, but that's angles, and that's good direct instruction. See, I was blessed. I had Fred Skinner and his students, especially uh, Ogden Lindsley and Eric Hockey, as my mentors. I had Zig Engelman and had him as a mentor for the last 30 years. I had Ogden R. Lindsley, the creator of Precision Teaching, as a mentor for 30 years. I had the creators of these three methods as my own personal mentors. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Is there any reason I shouldn't be good at this? Of course not. When you've been trained by the, the best, you should be able to learn. And anyone can learn this. Question? Yes. Yeah, okay. Good, good one. Thank you. Alright. This is the final E rule, right? So, we know it works for lots and lots of words. And then I'll do this. Okay, there are a few words it doesn't work for. Here they are. Some, love, dub. This does not say cone, this does not say soma, that does not say loathe. So we'll get a short list of words that are that they, the rule doesn't apply for, and we'll teach that as a separate list. There's, this will work for a whole lot of words. Okay. What's this word, everybody? Ready? Yeah. yeah. What word now? Ready? Fine. Oh, so you mean you can use this rule to work with words that I didn't teach you in the set? You can use this with any word that follows the rule? Yes. So by teaching this, you're teaching the power of giving the child the ability to figure out lots and lots of words, even if they weren't in the set you showed them. Right? Yeah. Does that answer your question? Right, thanks. Questions? Okay. You've been a very attentive audience. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to show you what we do. Uh, you will be able to see it working in this classroom over the next days, weeks, and months. And uh, I hope that uh, you will be as impressed as I expect to be. So, uh, I have a few books for any of them. Any of you who would like to delve into this in a little more detail, uh, my book, Teacher Children Well, is available. I'd be happy to sign it for you. And I'm going to go catch a plane and 